September now. We're in the, the third week of this series um, called Rhett. And if you remember week one, we talked about this guy, Simon, who was a pagan magician, and he got wrecked, and, and it was kind of on accident. I mean, he, he wasn't even pursuing God. He was just there for the kind of the fringe benefits. He wanted to learn new magic tricks, and sure enough, his life was interrupted by the gospel, and um, and, and, and we, we just really looked at the, the truth that there's no one out of the reach of God's arms, that his, long, his arms are long to reach out and save. Um, and, and then last week, um, we found out that, that God even saves people that are good and that are really good at being good. And this Ethiopian eunuch was a good guy. He was a God fearer. He was a God worshiper. But he didn't know the gospel yet. He didn't know Jesus yet. And so the gospel interrupts his life in, in a personal Bible study. He's reading, you know, the, he's reading the book of Isaiah, and, and God sends Philip into his life to share the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so tonight we're going to look at this man um, who turns out in Christendom to be a pretty big deal, and. Uh, and he, he wasn't just uninterested in the Lord, or, or he was interested in the Lord, but he wasn't just uninterested in the gospel. He was antagonistic towards Christians and Christianity. And so a part of what I want you to hear tonight, if you have been a Christian for a while, is to not give up on praying for those people that you've been praying for for a long, long time. And you've invited them here, and you've even tried to share the gospel with them, and that went horribly wrong. And so, so there's a tendency in us sometimes to just kind of give up on God, but just don't ever give up on a God who's never given up on you. And what we're going to see once again tonight is there is no one for which the cross and Christ's death and resurrection wasn't sufficient to save. Okay, so everyone is in with is within the reach of of God's arm. So, chapter nine of Acts it says, "But Saul." Now you'll remember we met Saul a few weeks back when. Um, when Stephen was being stoned, the, the first Christian martyr, and as Stephen was being murdered for his faith, if you'll remember, there was a young leader there, and his name was Saul, and he was holding the coats. And so it turns out that Saul is like this religious terrorist. And, and not only that, um, Saul is from this place called Tarsus, and, and Saul's pedigree is really unbelievable. Saul was a big deal. Um, Saul, not only was he from the tribe of Benjamin, which was like the best of the best Jewish tribe, and he was circumcised on the right day, and he was raised in the right family, and he was from the right side of the tracks. And the Bible says that Saul, who later becomes Paul, that he was a Pharisee of Pharisees, which has a double meaning. One, that probably means that like his granddad and great-granddad were also Pharisees. So, so um, you know, he got, he got the Pharisaical line kind of, honest, but it also means that of the Pharisees, he was like in the who's who of Pharisees. And so as far as uh, uh, Jewish culture goes, it doesn't get any better than Saul. But then to really blow your mind is that on the other side of it too, but Saul is from this place called Tarsus, and he was actually born as a Roman citizen. So he would be fluent in Greek and uh, Aramaic and Hebrew, and he studies at this, at this university called Tarsus. Tarsus was a university town. And if you would tell people that you were from Tarsus, um, they would know immediately that, that you were schooled in philosophy and law. And so that's probably what, what Saul studied in Tarsus. And again, it, it wasn't like junior college either. I mean, Tarsus was one of the three largest um, universities in the known world. This would be like Princeton, Yale, right, Georgia. I like mean, it's that kind of, you know, if you would be like, wow. Right? So, now, and I didn't go to Georgia. I could have gotten in there probably. I went to VCU. I don't know if you've even heard of that. Uh, it's a pretty good basketball team, but VCU is sort of like the Kmart of Virginia education. You know, like it's good stuff, but nobody brags about being there. You know what I'm saying? So, that's kind of where I was. I saw some Tarsus, probably got a degree in law, and then, and then he moves from Tarsus to Jerusalem, and he's trained under Gamaliel. Remember Gamaliel's advice? Another guy we met a few weeks ago. Gamaliel was the guy that said, hey, leave Peter and John alone, because if this is a man, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to just fizzle out anyway. But if it's a God, you can't stop it. That's Gamaliel. And Gamaliel, I mean, he was top dog. You couldn't just go and sign up to be trained under Gamaliel, which lets us know that Saul's family probably had lots of money and lots of influence and lots of political power. So this guy, Saul, is a big deal. But Saul, here's what he's into right now. 
still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, he went to the high priest and he asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So there's a lot there in that verse. Um, uh, first of all, um, so Saul is not just, he's not just getting mad at an individual Christian and trying to kill them. He is trying to systematically wipe out what he believes is this cancerous cult to Judaism. Because he's a Pharisee and he's about the law and he's about uh, religious rules. And so this idea of the way, which is what early Christianity was called, probably because Jesus said, I am the way. So people that follow him are, we're called people of the way. And so he is systematically um, getting the right documentation in order so that he and all of his cronies, whenever they came in contact with people that proclaimed Jesus as their Lord, just like Bob and the other folks did here in the water, that when they found them, that they could persecute them and kill them. And he's going all the way to Damascus. That's a long way from Jerusalem. You remember, um, you remember after after persecution begins to happen, then, then the Bible says that the Christians begin to scatter all over the place. And so Damascus is about 135 miles away from Jerusalem, from the birthplace of Christianity, for, from where Jesus was witnessed, resurrected, and walking around. This is 135 miles. And sometimes when we read this in the Bible, we forget that we're talking about real people here. So you can imagine that when word gets to Damascus, you know, somebody runs up and is like, you guys aren't going to believe it. But some people saw Saul on the road to Damascus. He's coming here after the Christians. You can just imagine some of those conversations at home. You know, the wife is coming to the husband going, he's, he's coming. Saul's on his way here. And if he finds us, we're dead. And I thought you said we wouldn't have to move anymore. I thought you said if we, if we made it 135 miles away, that this would be far enough. But listen, um, I, I, I don't know if we can risk the lives of our kids, and so maybe we need to pack up again. You know, Damascus, it would be like, uh, it's about from here to Orlando. And, and, you know, they couldn't hop in the SUV and just ride down there real quick. It, it probably took them two weeks of travel with their families to relocate because they're scared. They're literally running for their lives because they're afraid. That, that Saul is going to kill him. And then right in, in verse 2, when it says men or women, the reason Luke wants us to know this is that um, Saul is particularly ruthless. I mean, in the first century, to persecute women would be just unheard of. Um, so, I mean, you, you're probably aware that in the first century, women were like, you know, second class citizens, didn't have the same rights and things as men. And while most of the time, you know, we say, well, that's injustice, and how could that be? But there's a few times it works out for you, all right? Like when the Titanic's going down, it's not equal anymore. It's women and children first, all right? So that's kind of bummer for us, all right? So, you know, it's a little give and take. It's why um, when Jesus was arrested, and you remember the men running high, and the women are just kind of running around doing whatever they want, it's because nobody's going to mess with it. Even the Roman soldiers wouldn't persecute the women, okay? But, but not Saul. This would be unheard of. In our culture, it would be like if somebody harms a child, what we, we go crazy over that. Um, so Luke wants us to know that, that he's, he's coming after the women too. And he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. You see, um, to just get our minds around it, Saul of Tarsus was a religious terrorist. Okay? So think 9 11. That would be Saul. That much like um, radical Muslims that want to blow people up and think that God is somehow pleased by that, that that's what that's what Saul is doing. That he's thinking, well, I, I don't, I don't want to please my God. If I kill these people of the way, then God will look down on me and go, "Man, you know." And again, you know, ten years ago, we might, or twenty years ago, we might look at that and be like, "No, that would never happen." But you think there are people who live in our world right now and they really believe if I kill those people, then my God will be pleased. Okay? And it's not just a it's not just an Islamic thing. There are there are people that claim Jesus that think if I go and torture and abuse this group of people, then my God will be pleased. You've ever heard of Westboro Baptist Church? That's the church that tickets um the, the funerals of our fallen soldiers. And they somehow they believe that 
if, if they stand outside of the funeral of a fallen soldier with signs that say, God killed your son or God killed your daughter and he's pleased with it, then somehow they're, then God is going to be pleased. Okay, I just want you to know that's not our God. Okay? I, I don't know who they're worshiping, but it ain't Jesus. It ain't the Jesus of the Bible. Okay? And so one of the things that religion can do I mean, you take religion to, you, t- you get on that path and you go far enough and you can get into some twisted, self-serving places in the name of God. The problem with that is it has nothing to do with the heart of the one true God. And so Saul thinks he is on God's team by trying to crush the people of God's son. Verse 3. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus. And this is kind of awesome. In, in my mind, I don't know if this is how it happens, um, but in my mind, it's almost like God is just kind of, you know, he's hanging out in heaven, and Saul's just kind of persecuting his people and persecuting his people, and then God's like, all right, I've got enough. I'm just going to save him, all right, and just get him on our side. And so, uh, verse 3, and now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. Just he's riding on his horse, and God kicks his butt off his horse. I mean, just boom, the lights come on, right? And and big, bad Saul, I'll persecute you, falls off his horse. And one of the things I want you to see here is that God initiates salvation. All right? It is God who saves and not people, period. That God pursues you. You never went seeking after God. And so if you know him as your Lord and Savior, it's because he came after you. And he continues to pursue people regardless of where they are. Regardless of where they are. He, he saves people that are running from him. He saves people that are antagonistic against him. He saves people that are sitting in Bible study and sitting in church and grew up in Sunday school. He saves all different kind of people. And with Saul, he comes running after him and shines the bright light on him and kicks him off the horse. And, and think about this. How big is the love of our God? I mean... If you and I, if we would have lived in the first century, we would all think that Saul was outside of the bounds of the grace of God. I, I mean, I know the Bible says that we're all enemies of God, and we are, but, but Saul was like, oh, I mean, he's really an enemy of God. He is killing the children of God. And God would demonstrate his love for Saul, that while he was still a sinner, Christ died for him too. And so God comes after him. Verse 4, and falling to the ground, he, that's Saul, and falling to the ground, Saul heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Verse 5, and he said, Saul says, who are you, Lord? Which is kind of a funny question, right? So he sort of answers his question in his question, who are you, Lord? To which, who else could it be, right? How many bright lights have you run into that called out your name from heaven? So he kind of knows which, let me just tell you what's happening to some of you. Some of you are on your road to Damascus, and you're not out to kill Christians, but you're Lord of your own life. And you get in this place, and something starts happening in here, and you're going, what, who are you, Lord? And you, and on the one hand, you're saying, what is happening to me? How can I believe it? I am drawn back to come to church. I want to become a church person. Oh, no. And then on the other hand, you know it's the Lord working in you. So go ahead and just answer your own question. It's not me. It is the Lord just doing something in you. And so he cries out, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. This is big. To which Saul could reply, I'm not persecuting you. I'm persecuting the people of the way. Do you, you see what Jesus does here? So Jesus visibly, tangibly shows up face-to-face with Saul, kicks him off his horse, and he says, who are you, Lord? He goes, why are you persecuting me? This ought to bring you great comfort, church, that Jesus equates his people with him. So, in the New Testament, when the Bible talks about that we are the body of Christ, that's not just a euphemism. That Jesus means literally we are his body. And so, to, to persecute the followers of Jesus is to persecute Jesus. To harm the people of God is to try to harm God. Jesus himself equates us, the church, the people, the ecclesia, the movement, the gathering of the called out ones, that we are one with him, just like he prayed in, in John chapter 17, that the 
the high priestly prayer. On the flip side of that, that's probably why Jesus in Matthew 25 says, whatever you've done to the least of these brothers of mine, you've done unto me. So think about this from the other side, because I think we don't have a lot of Christian persecutors in here, okay? At least I hope not. If you are here, I'd love to introduce you to our security team later. That'd be fun. Okay? Um, so when you go on that mission trip, when you go on that mission trip and, um, and you kneel down eyeball to eyeball in the medical clinics that, that we're going to run, and you administer uh, you administer some vitamins and some diagnosis and some help and hold a hand, Jesus says, you're doing that to me. And when you go on those mission trips and you, you, you put on a VBS for little kids that nobody else really has time for, Jesus says, no, you're doing that. You're doing that for me. Whatever you've done to the least of these brothers of mine, you do for me. And so I hope you get comfortable in that. that Jesus is standing in the gap for his people and saying, why are you persecuting me? And so he kicks him off his horse. He says, I'm Jesus, who you are persecuting, verse 6, but rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. And the men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. I think the reason that, that Luke puts this in here is because he wants us to know this was an actual event. This wasn't a feeling that Saul had. This wasn't like, I have a vision, but it, there was nothing really visually there. That this was an actual event that actually happened in verse 8. And Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing, so he's blind. So they led him by the hand, and they brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and he neither ate nor drank. Okay, so God puts him in timeout. That's what happens. All right? He's like, you go into the city, and boom, you can't see, and, you know, no treats for you. That's what he does. And he puts him in time out. And you got to be thinking at this point, Saul, Saul, there's no plan of salvation that's happened yet. There's no redemption. There's no opportunity for repentance. All, the only conversation is, you kick his butt off the horse. Who are you, Lord? I am the Lord. Blind, hungry, go. That's all he gets. Very similar to, to Free spanking in my house. That's, what is, that's what's happening. And so you got to think in this moment, Saul must be the, I'm a dead man. I mean, the Lord's going to show up here and he's going to, it's on. I'm a dead man. But what you've got to understand is that, is that the Bible, all throughout the scriptures, the Bible talks about that God is a good dad and he's a good father, and all good fathers discipline their children to maturity. They discipline their children to to maturity, that this wasn't punitive, it wasn't punishment for being so evil, but God was just preparing him for what he had in store for him. It's why I discipline my kids. And it's, it's why we don't, you know, we don't do time out in my house, oh my goodness. And for those of you that grew up in the time out era, you know, I'm, I'm honestly, I'm a little jealous of you, all right? I wish I could have just stood in the corner and thought about it for a minute, all right? No, we didn't do that. We had, we had there was weaponry involved in But now on this end of it, praise God for Perry Martin, my daddy, who wore me out. I mean, I got beat more times than the bad guy in wrestling matches. You know what I'm saying? Thank God that my daddy loved me enough to wear me out. Don't, don't you I mean, it's so funny when you see kids just acting a fool. And it takes you two seconds to realize, oh, your parents just, they don't discipline you, right? Not like God has called them to. I mean, I can tell you, I'm a Walmart person. Gretchen, the Target girl, I'm a Walmart guy, right? Which really worked out, right? Church world, but, but I don't go to Target. I have fish and stuff and hunt stuff. Why in the world do you go to there? So anyway, go to Walmart. And so, and so you can also tell when parents don't discipline rightly at home because they over-discipline in public, you know, and it's kind of weird. The kids in the checkout office is going crazy. And then you see mom and just screaming, relax! I'm thinking, they're never going to understand what that word means, okay? They're never going to understand what that word means. And so in order to get the kids, you know, they just load them up with candy in the aisle because that's what they're crying for. And I'm thinking, well, they're going to shut up now, but I'm going to tell you what. Man, that's only going to escalate. It's only going to get worse. And so, from that kid's perspective, they're thinking, the parent that disciplines me is punitive against me. But what they don't understand is it's actually 
It's actually the grace of mom and dad, the mercy of mom and dad, that you would, you would get worn out when you're six. So that when you're 16 and you make a mistake, it doesn't cost you your life or prison time or your future. And so, so God puts, God puts Saul in this, I mean, kind of in this time out because he's going to discipline him into maturity. Verse 10. Now, I love this part, okay? I love this part. Now, there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord, which, come on, we talked about this last week. I wish the Lord would just talk to me like that. Hey, Joey, what's up, Jesus? You know, like it was just, how you been? All right, so, so he's just talking to him. So obviously, Ananias is dialed in. When the Lord calls his name, he knows. He's got to get confused about who's talking. He knows it's him. In verse 11, and the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias uh, come in and lay hands on him so that he might regain his son. Notice how specific God is in this vision. He tells him where to go and what part of town and whose house. Give him the address. I mean, so so go to Straight Street, all right? Don't go to 3rd Street, don't go to Beach Boulevard, go to Straight Street. I mean, this is a very specific vision, and he lays it out so clear because God is not a God of confusion. And then Ananias, look at his answer. But Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has the authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. In other words, um, Lord, are you sure about this? <laughs> because, because I don't, and, and listen, I mean, I chuckle when I hear this. God speaks to him. Ananias, yes, Lord, here I am. Here's where I want you to go. And then Ananias responds is, Lord, are you sure about that? I mean, I know I'm having this supernatural vision conversation thing with you that, you know, that Pastor Joby one day will not understand exactly how that works, but... I just want to point out a couple of things to you, Sovereign Lord, that you might not have learned about, all right? And, and, and as I chuckle at this, though, I'm, I'm also convicted about my own prayer life and how sometimes we pray like God is an idiot. You ever pray and you're filling God in on all the information? Or I get up here and say, you got, God is telling you to go on a mission trip. You have three years to go on a mission trip. And you're like, hey, God, uh, you know, our church is going on a mission trip to Jamaica. That's what I know. Like, I made Jamaica. Okay, I know. And we do it all the time. Good Lord, I just want to pray for Ted. He's like two cubicles over. You know, he's like six, three, ball in a dude. I said, I know. Right? I know. If we try to inform God, think about your prayer life. You can do more talking or listening. It's convicting, isn't it? I like to lay it out for the Lord. All right, Lord, here we go. I don't know if you notice, but our attendance is up. We're not. And so, Lord, here, here's what we need from you. All right. There's an empty wind dixie at the other end of the shop that said, Lord. And I know the word says that you own the cattle on a thousand hills, and it's the beef people, so I'm saying it's yours. So look it up. As if the Lord doesn't know that he's drawn every single person that's ever walked through these doors. And so our job as a staff, as elders, and as a whole church is to just listen to what he's telling us to do and just shut up and quit telling him what we think he ought to do. Because he's informed. He's got it. He's still got the whole world in his hands. And so Ananias, a faithful disciple, is like, are you sure, God? Verse 15. But the Lord said to him, Go! I think it was like that. All right? Like, parents, um, how many of you did the Lord bless you with little lawyers in your house? Anybody? Is it just me? All right? I mean, good gracious. I'm trying to tell my seven year old, I got this under control. Just listen to what I'm saying. All right? If you don't brush your teeth, nobody's going to ever talk to you. Brush them! I mean, you know, you get to that point where you just got to go. So go, he says. So, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine, of all people in the world. He is a chosen instrument of mine. Did you realize, at some, at some level, if 
you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are a chosen instrument, friend. Someday, sometime, whether it's for a couple weeks on a mission trip or it's in your office or it's in your family or it's in your neighborhood, that you and I can be a chosen instrument. He is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. And so even though Saul, who later, in a couple chapters, they're going to change his name to Paul, but, but Saul, he's got all the raw ingredients, but he still needs pruning and discipline. Verse 16, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. I heard Pastor uh, Perry Noble say this one time, and I just love it. He says, he was talking to church leaders, but it applies to all of us. He says, your capacity to lead and influence is directly related to your capacity to suffer for his name. So you might be walking through the valley of the shadow of death. But fear no evil, for his rod and his staff will comfort you. That God can use even the wickedness of this world, evil deeds of other people. When your dreams are shattered, whether you did it to yourself or the world happened to you, it really doesn't matter. God is suffering. He can use even those things for you to be an instrument of his name. Verse 17, so Ananias departed, and he entered the house, and laying his hands on him. Can you imagine how nervous Ananias is? He walks into church, and sometimes you know how maybe you've been here before when the Lord has spoken clearly to you. Maybe not out loud, verbally, uh, or audibly, but, but, but clearly. And then you start walking that out in faith, and it's just like God told you. And so you know he gets the straight street, and then he finds the guy's house, and then he goes in, and then he's like, dang it, there he is praying, just like God said. He would be. And so he's just one step at a time in obedience, and now he's going to walk up. Because you know what he's thinking? He's thinking Saul is a master terrorist. It's really just a ploy. He's pretend praying, and when I touch him, he's going to turn around and stab me. I mean, that's what's going to happen. But in faith, he walks up, and just imagine how nervous he is. And he's going to lay his hands on him in faith. It's because the Bible talks about things like this that when when you kind of pray, it's why sometimes you just feel hands on you praying. It's because somebody in our church feels led of the Lord to you. It could be a staff person or an elder or or one of our future deacons or somebody who's just, you know, going to pray. And it's why we do it that way. Because we just, there's just something about God has just wired us for relationships, and there's just something about. God reaching out through the hands of his sons and daughters to be his hands to lay upon him. Praise the Lord. We take that very, very seriously. Okay. So I know you can pray in your seat. You can. And God is just as present. He goes back as he is right up here. But there's something about coming up here and kneeling down and having someone come and lay their hands on you. And you just know I'm not alone. I have brothers and sisters walking with me. Challenge the dads. A lot of times I'm saying, listen, your husbands and dads, and you've got to pray for your family. And so a bunch of people poured out there all up here praying. And uh, uh, there's a guy at the church, and he, he felt led to go pray. And I don't want to tell you who it is, but his name's Dan Richard. And so he, uh, he's at his daughter, who's, uh, I think she's a, she's a freshman or a sophomore, and then you have, and she comes down, and she's praying, and she loves Jesus, and he just felt stirred up to go pray for her. And so he peels out and walks down the aisle, and there she is, and he's just having this, like, father-daughter moment, and he puts his, her, his hands on her shoulder, and he's just praying for her, bless her, keep her, watch over her, and, you know, just praying, and then when he gets down, he lays down, and just kisses her on the head, and I love you, and he goes back to his seat, sit down, and there she is, sitting right there. Uh-oh! <laughs> You know that girl saying, man, that's a friendly church. I'm going to tell you what. That's a friendly church. <laughs> so Ananias departed and he entered the house and laid his hands on him. He said, Brother Saul, to the terrorists. Now here's the thing Ananias probably knew firsthand some people that were killed by Saul or some of his under. He had every reason to hate, every reason to despise, every reason to not trust him. 
sets him above us. The call to God. And so he goes and here's what he says. He says, repent because the kingdom of God is near. And listen, brothers and sisters, regardless of your past, regardless of your struggles, you are welcome in this place. This is a big dysfunctional family. If you think you're perfect, you do not fit in here well at all. If you know you are broken, broken and wretched, and saved by grace, you welcome my brothers and sisters. You do not hang your head above your past, because you are welcome in this place. And I know it, because I'm the chief sinner in the room. And somehow that made me like it. So brothers and sisters, welcome. And so, he says, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me to you that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from the eyes and he regained his sight and then he rose and he was baptized. You notice what happened here. You notice the order. He surrenders his life to Jesus and then he's baptized. So he rises and he's baptized. Verse 19, and taking food, he was strengthened. So God wrecks him, kicks him off his horse, blinds him, doesn't eat for three days, humbles him, and now he's in the rebuilding process. I don't know where you are on that journey, that's my hope and my prayer for you. On whatever road you're on, I hope the Spirit of God blinds you and humbles you and breaks you, and then you get to be part of this joyous journey of watching him rebuild you in his name. For some days, he was with the disciples at Damascus. See, Paul, Saul was in a disciple group. We launched ours on February 4th. You know him. Verse 20, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, he is the Son of God. You know what we found at the Church of Philippians 22? That the, it's the people that have just recently put their faith in Jesus that are usually the most excited about proclaiming that Jesus is the Son of God. I mean, we see it all the time. And, and by the way, if you were invited here tonight by somebody that got baptized, it's because they want to proclaim to you specifically. They wanted you to hear that Jesus is the Son of God. And so he's excited and he's proclaiming he is the Son of God. Verse 21, and all who heard him were amazed and they said, is this not the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name? And has he not come here for this purpose to bring them bound before the chief priest? Can I tell you what the number one witnessing tool in the world is? It's a changed life. For, for, for some of you, the fact that you've given your life to the Lord, especially if you grew up around here, and some of your friends or family are going, what, you go to church now? And you go, I know, it is crazy, isn't it? Glory to God. Well, that's why he saved you. It's for his own glory. It's because there's some other people that used to get high and drunk and party with, and they're thinking, well, if you can get saved, I think I can get saved too. And so get excited. I mean, get excited, just like he was. And run around and tell people, he is the son of God. Verse 22 but Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving, underline that word, by proving that Jesus was the Christ. Uh, he wasn't saying this is my opinion. He wasn't saying like, hey, look, you know, you do your thing and I do my thing. That's what works for you and this is what works for me. No, no, no. Saul was proving that Jesus is the Christ. Look, apologetics are important. It's why we dig in the scriptures. It's why we don't water things down and, you know, we don't go JV sermons. Uh, we try to teach the word. Apologetics are important. It's important to know what you believe. It's also important to know why you believe what you believe. So that's why you need to be in a disciple group to dig in. Um, uh, if you read Christian books and things, let me just give you this little point. You, you, you might want to read a book by somebody that's dead. Right? Everything good written in Christian Christian literature has been written in the last 20 years. All right? You might want to dig into some deep stuff there. Dig in and be discipled because... because when, especially if you do what we talked about the last few weeks and open your mouth and talk about the gospel and people ask some questions, it's good to know why you believe what you believe. Verse 23, many days have passed and the Jews plotted to kill him. Plotted to kill Saul. How ironic is that? Saul, the Christian killer, is now on the run for his life by people that want to kill Christians. And so when many days have passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. And they were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him, but his disciples took him by night and let him down through, down, let him down through an opening 
in the wall, lowering him in the basket. Listen, what better guy to take the gospel into hostile t- territory than the expert on hostile territory? So they come to kill him, and what does he do? He's like, well, I know how to do it. See, if they're at the gates, you just lower me down the window. We used to do this all the time. You know what that means? That I means uh, whatever God saved you from, if you'll pay attention, oftentimes he will use you to to join the rescue mission right back in the arenas that you got saved out of. Because you know all the excuses and you know all the crutches and you know all the dumb stuff that people from that world are leaning on. And so who better to go back into that world than somebody that was saved from that world? Now listen, now notice, there was a period of pruning though. All right, alcoholic, you might not want to just hop right back at the bar scene. But let me tell everybody about Jesus. Okay? So it's a question of influence. If you're being influenced by that arena, then you hop out. If you're being the influence, then that, that's an affirmation that God may be called you back into. Okay? And so, so this, I mean, he knows all the tricks. Verse 26. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. Notice that, attempted to join the disciples. But they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple, you think? So he shows up and says, hey, I want to go to church. No, you ain't going to our church. Verse 27, but Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So I want our church full of a bunch of Barnabases that see people walk through that doors that, that maybe they look uncomfortable. You can always tell the visitors because they're always just kind of looking at us and this is Walmart. You know, they, so we need to be a church full of people that go to them and say, welcome, but we save a seat for you. And, and not, I mean, not, what a shame it would be if God was drawing someone unto himself and the barricade between that person and God was you. Where you parked sat, you thought you owned the seat that you're sitting in. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of Saddleback Church. Big old metal monster, you know, big, awesome, Rick Warren Church. Okay, it's cool. Gretchen and I went there maybe uh, 10 years ago or so. And uh, I was friends with a guy on staff and I was speaking in the high school ministry, but I wanted to go see Big Church, right? And so I did my little deal there, so we were late walking into the service. And we walked in and that place is packed. I mean, there's not a seat anywhere, and there's people outside, and, and it was obvious that we were visitors, because we walked in and we started looking up, and I said, you know, that's it. And there's this, there's this couple, I'm guessing in their 60s, in the back row, and they see us, this young married couple, and we're obviously new to the church, and they got up, and they said, and we walk over, and the music's going, and they lean over, and they say, we've been saving these two seats for you, and then they just like disappear. And I didn't even have time to go, no, 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 I'm already a Christian. I, I'm actually a professional one. You sit there, and I go to church all the time, and I didn't even have time. But they were like Barnabas. They found an opportunity to not just welcome us, but try to plug us in. Here's what I thought. I thought at that moment when I sat down in that seat, I thought, I don't care what I believe. I'd be back in this church every time. I don't care how big it was, how famous the pastor is. I don't, I don't care about any of that stuff. But, but those folks were like Barnabas. So look, don't give up on people too early. Church 11, 22, we'll never ask, what are they doing? Okay? You'll go find every person who walks through this door and make a place. Verse 28, so he is. So he went in and out among them and saw at Jerusalem preaching boldly in the name of the Lord, and he spoke and disputed against the elders that they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus back to his hometown. Verse 31, so the church throughout all Judea and, and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up. One of the reasons it had peace is because the main terrorist had been converted. That always helps. All right, so this next line, I wish I had more time to hang out on it. When I read this uh, a while ago, it just, just, you know, I just wanted to sit in it. This is the description of the church in walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit in the church of Baltimore. 
Listen, church, we've been called to walk in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And they sound like they're diametrically, diametrically opposed, don't they? The fear of the Lord, like fear and comfort usually don't go together. They're usually the opposite ends of the spectrum. And yet it's this beautiful description of the Christian life. What does it mean to walk in the fear of the Lord? Are you supposed to be afraid of God? Yes. Yes. And in fact, in, in evangelical church, a lot of times in our attempt to express the grace and the mercy and the love of God, sometimes we do we, we just ignore, we do away with the justice and the wrath of God. So Jonathan Edwards is right. We are sinners in the hands of an angry God. And he hates sin. He hates, he despises sin. And you and I are not just mistakers. We, uh, before Jesus, were enemies of God. But not just not just kind of uh, neutral, and we don't know him, and he's just the better option, but enemies of God, destined for an eternal hell. I mean, it's a big deal. You want to know how big sin is to God? Look at the cross. It's not something to be overlooked. Look at the cross. Look at the, the, the beating and the flogging and the crown of thorns and the nail-pierced hands and the hanging up on the cross. And my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that should stir a little fear of reverence. You don't just, you know, Jesus ain't your homeboy, all right? But he is the almighty, resurrected, everlasting, King of kings and Lord of lords. And we should walk in the fear. That healthy reverence. Like, I had a fear for my dad's little bit. He's always 60. I have a beating butt. And he looks at me and says, son, I'm like, oh, it's all right. All right. He's just like, you know, we'd be in that restaurant, me and, me and my brother Russ would be goofing around. He would just give me the look. He didn't have to go relax. He wouldn't do that. He'd be over by then, okay? We'd be on the news if we had to scream something. Yeah. It was just this. Okay. Now that didn't mean I, I know he loves me. I know he's my dad, but it was this healthy reverence. They would walk in the fear of the Lord, folks. He's the Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth. Right? He is no respecter of person. He is perfect, sovereign, and judge, and king. He will do whatever he wants to do because he is God, and not even have to explain it. If you say, well, I don't understand why God, well, you don't have to understand. He's God and you're not. Okay? And He is eternal. And you get, if you're lucky, 80 years here. Walk in the fear of the Lord. You and I are sinners in the hands of God. And that is not the good news. Okay? The doctrine of total depravity is not the good news, it's just the on ramp to the gospel. It's just the diagnosis. The beautiful part is the next line. So they walked in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. The only reason I tell you every week almost that you're a wretched, black-hearted sinner is because I need you to know that. Because as I look back over my life, what happens is when I realize what I was saved from, because I'm going to tell you, if you knew my sins, you wouldn't let me be your pastor. The people I've hurt, the people I've used, the people I've abused, you wouldn't, you'd be like, oh, well, come on, man, you're disqualified. I know, I know, and yet he saved me. He reached down and he rescued me. And as I grow in my relationship with him, I, I become aware of two, um, two polarities. I'm, I'm more and more and more aware of my wretchedness and my sinfulness and my depravity. And I'm more and more aware of his holiness and his perfection and being the eternal, almighty God. And the gap seems to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And what the comfort is of, of the Holy Spirit is knowing that it's the cross that fills that gap. And so, again, we, we're not just going to hang out on wretched, black-hearted sinner. Because, but when you're diagnosed there, when you know what you've been saved from, then you realize the, how, how God has lavished his, his love among us. That we were so bad that he had to die for us, but he loved us so much that he was willing to. You see what happens there? And so if you skip over that part, if you skip over the fear, 
then, then it takes you two seconds to just fall into this moralistic deism where God just wants you to be a better version of yourself. And that's not the gospel. The gospel is that chasm between our depravity and His holiness is so big, the only thing that could fill it was the cross. And as, you, as we begin to understand that, that gap in what we were saved from, whether we were saved from a lifestyle of wickedness or religiosity, they both speak to God. Cross is the only thing big enough to fill that gap. And I tell you, it's why the biggest thing in this room is that cross. And I want it to be the biggest thing in your life and in my life. And that's how you walk in the fear of the Lord, Almighty Sovereign God. And the Almighty Sovereign God wants you to know Him as Heavenly Father. He says, Come on boldly into my presence. Climb up into Daddy's lap. My arms will wrap around you, not not in judgment, because my wrath was poured out on my son, so that you could walk in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. I hope you do that. I hope you never, you never graduate from that. You never walk away from that. You just marinate in that for the rest of your life. And that's what the church is called to do. I put it this way in your notes. Let us not deny nor be defined by our past. Because either way is a mistake. If you, if you deny it, as if that never happened, then, then you won't walk in the fear of the Lord. But you, you're also not to be defined by it. The truth is, even though I tell you, you wretched, black-hearted sinner, if you know Jesus, you're not evil. You're more than a conqueror. You're a son or a daughter of the Most High God. You're an heir to His kingdom. You're a new creation. You don't have to do what you used to do, because you're not the person you used to be. The old you was dead, and the new you has been resurrected. And that's the good news. So, you do not deny your past, but neither is your future defined by your past. But, trust the sufficiency of the cross to secure your destiny. To secure your destiny. And I know destiny kind of sounds like a new agey kind of word, but look what 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, 9, put it in your notes. It says this, for God has not destined us for his wrath. Did you, have a, you have a destiny? And God has not destined us for wrath but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live in Him. And so we need, to, we need to understand both of those, our total depravity and the complete sufficiency of the cross to fill the gap between our sinfulness and His holiness. And when we do that, the more we're able to understand that like Saul, and we can walk in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. When we can do that, that's when we can walk in Romans 8, 1. Therefore, now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So when, when, you're not, when you're not defined by your past and you're not denying your past, you don't let the devil bring up your past because you go, no, there's no condemnation in that. You, you don't ever question God's love for you. It increases our understanding that God loves us. Because we know, Romans 5, 8, that God demonstrates His love for us in this, that while we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. And as we walk in the fear of the Lord, as we walk in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, no condemnation, that His love once and for all was an exclamation point, was a done deal, it is finished at the cross, for us, our love, our gratitude, our Heavenly Father, that want to be close to Him, to be near in Him, to not be defined by yesterday, but to step into what He has destined us for, which is salvation in His name. So listen, folks, may you and I cling to Jesus, cling to Jesus as God's declaration that He loves you. No matter what you did yesterday, no matter what you're even doing today, that cross is the declaration of His love and for you. In your walk with Him, may you grow smaller and smaller, and may the cross grow larger and larger and larger. Please stand and pray. Our good and gracious Heavenly Father, God, we thank you uh, that you, Sovereign Lord, can use religious terrorists like Saul show us what it looks like to walk in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. God, may this be a church that walks in the fear of the Lord. God, that we revere you, that we honor you because you are the King of Kings. And God, may this be a 
cultures, walks in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And above all, you want to be known as Heavenly Father. Dad loves us. He loves us enough to discipline us. He loves us enough to speak to us. He loves us enough to call us into a relationship with you. And that God, you've demonstrated it once and for all. At the cross. We pray for Jesus. And this is the time when we respond. And you can respond in a number of ways. You can respond by coming to the altar and praise. You can respond by taking your tithes and offerings to the giving boxes. Maybe some of you need to respond by surrendering your life to the Lordship of Christ. Most often we do that by saying, raise your hands tonight. We're going to do it a little bit different. If you're ready to surrender your life to Christ, then you walk back to the Connect Center and you're going to have a conversation with somebody back there. We've got a staff and staff and volunteers and they will help you walk through what it 